Welcome back to A Complete History of Manchester United. I'm your host, Wayne Barton, author and producer of Manchester United Books and Films, joined as always on this journey by the legendary football writer, legendary retired football writer and journalist, Paddy Barclay. We're going on this journey through Old Trafford history. If you're watching the video, please give it a like and subscribe. Join in the conversation in the comments section. If you're listening back on the audio platform, please be sure to subscribe and give us a review on the platform you're listening on. Um, and obviously, um, there are plenty of episodes already available for you to go and check um, any individual season in United history post-war. Um, today, Paddy, we are looking at the 63-64 season. And after uh, a, a pre-season where United, they play an individual friendly in Glasgow, they play another one in Frankfurt, then they're back um, going up to Liverpool to play the um, Charity Shield against Everton. But all is not rosy and well in the Old Trafford camp, is it? No, it's not. Uh, there was, a, 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 a as, as we recall, the last episode finished with United gloriously winning the FA Cup. Um, and, uh, you know, Dennis Law, David Head, you know, banging in the goals. And it should have been great, but there was rancor, particularly between Johnny Giles, who played in the Cup final, but always felt that Matt Busby didn't really like him. Um, or have faith in him. And uh, they were in Rome, actually, that summer. Uh, I, but that was that was post-season. You talked about the yeah. pre-season. But after the cup final, they'd, went, they'd gone to Rome. And at one stage, Giles was in the toilet. And uh, in came Busby and Jimmy Murphy. And Busby sort of, what he thought was genially, said, hey, what about this lad in the cup final? And Giles was so paranoid about Busby's attitude towards him was that he felt, well, why shouldn't I have played well in the cup final? You weren't surprised that Dennis played well. You know, why, why make such a big thing? And it, it just showed how deep the rift between them was. Anyway, um, when Giles came back from his holidays in, in Ireland, he found out that the the the, the, pay, the, the wages had been doled out for the for the season. The players had got a fiver rise, so they were on thirty pounds a week plus ten pound of appearance. So they could earn fifty pounds in a good good week. Um, but Busby had been given twenty pounds, uh, well, like one thousand a year, twenty pounds a week pay rise. So there was still a feeling that the players were being treated in a rather mean manner. And so there was, there was, there was the usual. I mean, how, how many times have we said the season started with sort of a feeling that the players weren't being very generously treated? Well, this was, uh, this was no exception. However, the, the general mood, certainly from Busby's point of view, was uh, improved when after the Charity Shield match, which you rightly mentioned uh, as having been moved right to the beginning of the season, it, it then became known as in the journalistic cliche, the traditional curtain raiser to the season. It actually did raise the curtain on this season, but not in a very flattering way for United. Uh, they were beaten by Wayne. Who was it? Who, uh, was it Everton Villa? were the league champions. Ever Everton, of course. Everton had won the, the league under Harry um, Harry Gatrick. And, um, and uh, yeah, that was a hammering. And after that, uh, Busby dropped uh, Gaskell, the goalkeeper, um, Albert Quicksall, David Hurd, surprisingly. Yeah. And of course, less surprisingly, Johnny Giles. At which that was just enough for Giles. Giles went to him, slapped in a transfer request. Busby said, I shall put it before the board, which was a yes, basically. Because um, if Busby wanted someone transferred, the board would, of course, say, be guided by him. And within a couple of weeks, uh, Johnny Giles was a Leeds United player. 32,500 Leeds paid for him, which I suppose was a, a lot for a player who wasn't an automatic first team choice. 
but uh, in years to come, it would be reviewed by Leeds as one of their greatest signings, if not their greatest signing of all time. And uh, anyway, it was it. Yes, United had lost the player who was to prove virtually world class, but at least Busby had this wasp out of his ice cream, basically. <laughs> and um, uh, anyway, they, it was a season that began with quite a lot of youthful promise, uh, Wayne. Uh, a decent start. Yeah, we, we um, there's a 3-3 draw on the opening day against Sheffield Wednesday. One of the, repl well, Giles' replacement, Ian Moyer, comes into the side and, and scores on that day. Chisnell is the inside forward that comes into the team in place of uh, Quicksall. David Sadler is the, the man who plays at centre-forward in place of David Hurd. Sadler, uh, I'll just pop up on the screen for a moment because obviously this is his debut. Um, he's in the youth team at the moment. Yeah. Um, but he's, uh, we'll talk about his style a little bit later on, but he's he's deemed ready to play in um, a central forward position for yes. United. Um, yeah, and, and I mean, David does, Sadler was a meteoric rise, even compared with with uh, George Best, who we're going to discuss in, in great detail as well. Um, they lived, they had the same digs in Acliffe Avenue, Cholton Come Hardy, Sadler and Best, both 17-year-olds. But Sadler had been working in a bank in in Maidstone, Kent, um, only a few months earlier, Busby and Murphy had driven through the hop fields there to, 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 to David Sadler's dad's um, house uh, to, to persuade him, and um, and and so and David was was judged ready for for action very, as you say, very very quickly uh, as a centre forward, and um, he in fact was to play for United did as a centre-forward, centre-half and midfield player. Yeah. Uh, did everything but play in goal, uh, Sadler. But a great uh, great start to his to his career because did he score in the, you know, his, on his debut? It, not on his debut, no. Um, uh, two for Charlton in the 3-3 uh -huh. draw. So they were the other goals in there. But um, he, he had a decent start. He had yeah. three goals in his first seven games and we'll talk about the third of those in a moment okay um united's decent start i mean they they win 5-1 against champions everton they yep. win 7-2 at portman road there i mean denny slow scores the first of seven hat tricks this season which is just ridiculous but <laughs> that's the theme of this season really there's a quote from denny slow um he said that's it was a little bit later in jeffrey green's um, there's only one United book. He said yeah. the cup final was the turning point. All the time, we felt we only needed some little turn of the screw to get us going. Yeah. Everything suddenly clicked into place on the day. We played some really good stuff at last. Um, and Pat Curran said later on, whenever Law was in the side, the whole team felt they had a goal start at kickoff. And certainly that's how it seemed this yeah. season because he was scoring at a rate of more than a goal a game. Um, he wasn't on the score sheet in mid-September when United welcomed West Brom to Old Trafford. It was a tight game. Previously, the week earlier, the same teams had met in a reserve game at Old Trafford. And George Best had played and United won. George Best was in the team um, for this game. Now, um, Sadler scored the, the only goal of the game. Uh, but it is remembered mostly for, for George's debut, even though he didn't score. And it's fair to say that um, and we've talked about George in previous, uh, probably the last three or four episodes, really, and, and this is his first time making this impression into the first side. Uh, you mentioned he, he, he travelled with the um, with the team down to Wembley for the cup final, which is yes. quite great, and that was the occasion where he'd be informed, he was informed that he'd be signed as a professional. And he yeah. was, it was a few days later, his birthday. So yes. um, that was, I mean, he couldn't say anything's guaranteed in football, but it was pretty much certain because Best had made an impression unlike anyone since Duncan Edwards and, and in a very different way as well. I mean, it was clear that he had a star quality in a team that already, the youth team had a lot of talent in there, but he, like Edwards, was a very, very individual, uh, yeah. player, well, star really, in a very different kind of player. Obviously, there were stories of whereas Duncan would bulldoze through players and, and he'd just win games single handedly. George would do that, but he's the famous phrase is Will o the Wisp, isn't it? There were stories yeah. where players would give him the ball from kickoff and he'd run past everyone and score. 
Jim Ryan, when I was writing the, the biography in George, he told me a great story about how many times George would run past him, nutmegging him in training and laugh while he was doing it. Yeah. Um, Harry Gregg, I'm sure you had the same stories about George from Harry where um, yeah. he was recovering from the shoulder injury, so he was training with the junior players and George absolutely made a fool of him in, in one session where I think he chipped him the first time round. Harry said, you're not going to do that again. So he, he sort of stayed firm but when George went through one-on-one -on -one, he dropped him twice and rolled the ball in that happened the first time he said you won't do that again when George duly did it he chased him yeah. on Harry chased him on the cliff um he was only five seven five eight at that point very very slight as well you can see from the images of George and I'll put the the picture up of the George you can see how, how tiny his frame is at this point it looked like the wind might break him but he yeah. also had an incredible courage Paddy uh, sometimes yeah. it seemed in these early days that he was a little bit surprised by how good he was. That he was surprised by the, the, by the fact he could go on to his debut against a an experienced defender like Graham Williams. Yeah, and almost a little bit surprised that he could take the Mickey out of him. Everyone remembers that he nutmegged Graham on one occasion. Mm -hmm. um, what? So talk to me about the. I and mean, obviously, we'll talk about the impact George had over his entire career. But in those early days, what was it like to see a player back, come onto the scene like that? Well, it was obviously very, very exciting indeed. Um, I mean, at the same time, I'm, I'm sure you'll mention uh, Willie Anderson, who came in at 16, Liverpool-born winger. And there were these two sort of long-haired wingers of, of the picture you, you just showed, for those who, who, who didn't, um, who were listening just on audio, uh, was of George with a short back and sides. But um, pretty soon after he got into the team, his hair began to grow. And um, yes, I mean, George was, was clearly, I mean, unbelievably exciting. I mean, he, whereas Johnny Giles before him had been criticized by Busby and, and Murphy for, well, particularly Busby for, you know, going on the outside when he should have been going, according to them, going inside and vice versa. George, right from the start, was pretty well a law unto himself. Uh, unlike Willie Anderson, who was more of a, a, a classic winger, you know, if we, if we go back to the previous United sides like Charlie Mitten, say. Um, but uh, George would come inside and, and, and stroll off the wing and, and just so that he could get the ball. And once he got the ball, uh, opponents and uh, teammates alike had a great deal of difficulty in getting it off him. So right from the start he kind of had his own rules but that was what in the early discussions two years earlier when he'd come over from Belfast two and a half years earlier when he'd come over from Belfast there was an early and brief discussion between Murphy and Busby as you, you, you people who've listened to previous may recall uh Busby felt you know that George would be an even better player if he let go of the ball a little bit earlier let the ball do a bit more of the work and Murphy said, no, no, we, we, we don't coach this one. No, we just uh, let him. And uh, anyway, right. So right from the start, he was kind of, he was entertaining. He was uh, thrilling. And uh, uh, so now uh, Manchester United, although Busby did, after his debut, there, there, were, there were times when Busby left him out, you know, the, in the time-honored fashion um to let him build up his physique and so on so he hadn't fully become a first team regular but we now had law best and charlton in the same team although i think even in those early days nobody quite knew what an impact that yeah. triumvirate would have on uh, the game the world game as well as uh, as well as manchester united yeah, and we didn't see them all together for a little while because Best was out, um, like you said, rightly back into the reserves. Busby a little bit concerned. And I think he also wanted to give Moya this last chance to take yes. that other as well. Um, yeah. But there, there was no Best for a while and there was no Dennis Law. A week after scoring a hat-trick, one of his many, um, against mm -hmm. Spurs, this is a great line from Dennis as well. He said, we always used to batter Spurs at Old Trafford and then we'd get battered at Whitehall Lane and they yeah, would always yeah. end the games. On this occasion, Law scores an hat trick. Next week, he's sent off and then he's suspended for 28 days. Um, and, I mean, Paddy, I mean, this 
really, really, if we think of Busby in the way that he liked playing football, this was kind of a little bit of a, a miserable season for him in that re- regard. Not in terms of the way that we played, because obviously the, the style of yeah. football speaks for yeah. itself, but in terms of the conduct, it, it was a little bit spiky. Yeah, the conduct. I remember the conduct. Well, we were beginning to get little bits of hooliganism off the field. So that was a, an underlying worry, but more spectacular was the on the field stuff. Now in the first 15 years of Busby, um, of Busby's tenure as Manchester United manager, 15 years, three players sent off, Alan B. Chilton, Henry Coburn, and latterly Mark Pearson. In three months of this season, the uh, three players were sent off. And obviously one was Dennis, who got sent off for retaliation in the first half of a match against Manchester uh, Aston Villa, uh, managed by Busby's friend Joe Mercer. A shock defeat, and off went Dennis. Uh, it was just before um, before the Christmas New Year holidays, so he was able to go back to Aberdeen. This was the urban, well, urban. I was about to say urban myth, but. It, the statistics would show that it was a little bit more than a myth that Dennis did tend to get sent off just before Christmas uh, <laughs> and therefore suspended. But there we go. Um, um, but yes, yeah, so the Dennis, equally predictably, Paddy Creran was sent off uh, for a, um, a most unfestive elbowing at Burnley. Um, and... Uh, the third one to go, less characteristically, was David Heard. United, having won the Cup, were in the European Cup Winners' Cup. And David Heard was sent off in against Willem Twe in Holland. Um, so that was three sent off in the period of three months. So it clearly was the behavioural issues. He bought Creran to, you know, to not yeah. only to play, but to enforce. And he knew Dennis Law was fiery. Um, so it can't have been too much of a surprise, but uh, yeah, three settings off would not have been uh, ideal from Busby's point of view. No, um, the, the latter of those was the crowned one at Burnley. And yeah. um, it was a Boxing Day, you quite rightly mentioned Law was still on his holidays. Um, yeah. Aaron sent off in the second half of this. This is the famous Boxing Day game where 66, uh, Boxing Day um, schedule where 66 goals are scored in the 10 games and yeah. seven at Turf Moor, uh, six for Burnley, unfortunately. And it, in, um, it basically prompted one of those famous Busby shakeups, didn't it? So he, this is where he called in best again and he called yes. in Madison to make yeah. his debut uh, in the return against Burnley and United scored five best scoring in that and then from then on best in the team forevermore um pretty much anderson in and out he still gets his fair share of games but um best is i mean let's not say he plays every single game but he's, he's pretty much a senior player from that point uh we move forward to the middle of january um at west brom which is the first time when best law and charlton are on the same score sheet together you know yeah. win 4-1 at the Orthorns. And it's a strong second half of the season. Best, uh, now he's in the side. Charlton beginning his gravitation into the middle of the park, into the inside yeah. forward position, yeah. striking up a rapport. We should mention at this point as well, because Quicksall is sold just before Christmas, yes. and because of this area of the pitch that doesn't have that much experience, and Charlton is sort of earmarked to move in that area, Busby signs Graham Moore, and we'll talk about him a little while mm-hmm. in a little while. But he comes from Chelsea for around thirty-five thousand pound, yeah. And um, he's basically to add experience in the middle of the park, basically. And um, United, the the influx of the youth players that are coming in, yeah. sort of unfortunately for for he's a little bit like Carol Poborski when you know he comes in after with his high reputation, but all the youth players are in the side and yes. Um, he's a bit bit caught out by that, um, really. But more, he, he still plays his part. Don't get me wrong. But United, uh, with best doing what he does, with Charlton having more of an influence centrally, um, mm. United finished the season really strongly. 
they finished second in the league actually. Then for a while they looked like they're going to be good competitors for the title, Paddy. But it's a three 0 loss to Liverpool in the decisive game in early April. Um, obviously, a massive turnaround from the nineteenth place of the previous season. Yes, you, you would say looking at this side, it, they were still conceding too many goals, and you would have thought is the second was a good a good achievement from this season. Yeah, it was a very good achievement, especially as um, it was complemented by a run to the semi-finals of the FA Cup. So they were competitive in both competitions. They weren't able to retain the FA Cup, um, being knocked out by um, a Bobby Moore-inspired West Ham. But uh, it was uh, it was a good season, um, and a, you know, a good follow-up to the um, to the cup win the previous year. I mean. There were some good wins just before the loss at Liverpool, which, as you rightly say, killed off title hopes. Had come a, a win at White Hart Lane, so it wasn't yeah. always uh, it, 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 White Hart Lane wasn't always the graveyard for United's hopes. But um, so there was there was there was a lot to to celebrate, as you say. The defence wasn't um, completely um, solid because. The goalkeeping situation wasn't really resolved, and um, um, because of Greg's injuries, <clears throat> and uh, but overall, yes, you, you would have to say a more than uh, a more than satisfactory uh, season for United. Yeah, the the club run you mentioned, Dennis Law scored a remarkable ten goals in that run, but United yeah. are beaten in the semi final by West Ham, who, who at least went on to win it. The European uh, football, the Cup Winners' Cup. It, actually, United were drawn against Spurs in that one, and they eliminated them along the yeah. way. But they, um, it, there's a, a funny one because obviously those games had big turnarounds as well. Um, well, you know, it looked like Spurs were going to go through, and then United went through. Yeah. And it was like case with Sporting Lisbon. United win the first leg like, four one, and mm. then they go to Lisbon and lose five nil. Um, mm. And this was Busby. Um, Best recalled that Busby gave a rare air dryer to the team. It was very difficult. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I can remember uh, when I was uh, researching the, the book, my biography of, of, of Matt Busby, that I asked Dennis uh, Law, um, you know, how bad uh, was was the, the bollocking that Busby dished out after the game in Lisbon. And uh, he more or less said, I don't know, I was hiding under the dressing room table with my hands over my ears, you know. But it was, um, yeah, pretty bad. I mean, it was it was actually immediately after that that it, it obviously worked because it was immediately after that that they got the, the uh, league win at Spurs. But uh, no, Busby was furious about that because, you know, with a 4-1 lead going to Lisbon, um, you know, good though, you know, the Portuguese, the top Portuguese teams could be, um, you know, that, that, that was, that was not, not allowed. Um, on the European dimension though, just uh, to complete that, Dennis Law was, was given the Ballon d'Or uh, yeah. by France football uh, for Europe's leading player. In those days, it was over the calendar year. So it was the calendar year 64, uh, during which he scored 46 in 41 for United. Phenomenal. And as if that wasn't enough, he scored 11 in 7 for Scotland, which is amazing, yeah. isn't it? I mean, that's 50, 57 goals in 48 games. You know, at, at a high and he had a month off. Sorry, and he had a month off as well. Well, exactly. The benefits of our mid-season break were obviously were there for all to see. But it, it by the time he'd gone on that holiday, he's already scored enough in that calendar year to be named as Europeans, Europe's Player of the Year. Um, so uh, this gives you an idea that United are already a a force, a, a, a force across Europe. Um, and uh, this, of course, was only to, to increase in the, in the years to come. But 
an interesting thing about the domestic scene, if we if we go back briefly to that, wolves drop down the table. Now, as the, uh, all the students of United History will know that in that, for the first, goodness knows how many years of Busby's tenure as Manchester United manager, his greatest rival was uh, one friend, Stan Cullis of Wolves. They were always the yardstick again and vice versa. Yeah. Um, so it, this was the decline of Cullis's Wolves around this time. But another friend of Busby's sprouts up and uh, uh, to, to uh, threaten him, and that's Bill Shankly. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, again, I think we mentioned either in the previous episode or the episode before that Bill Shankly was already close and had almost like a, a the father-son relationship with Busby. And, uh, you know, when the fiery Shankly was threatening to resign from this club or the other, Huddersfield or whatever it might be, uh, you know, he'd ring Busby, and Busby would say, "No, no, no, don't go because, don't go because you've got, you've got if you've got nowhere else to go, and this, that, and the other." So Busby had been a a sort of almost a mentor for Shankly, and this was how Shankly uh, thanked him by <laughs> winning the league uh, with Liverpool, and, um, and and as you say, the 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 victory uh, the late season victory over United, Liverpool's late season victory over United killed United's own hopes. Yeah. So anyway, they, Shankly had become the new Cullis, uh, yeah. the new, uh, you know, the new arch opponent of Busby's United. It's not the only thing, those points um, that Shankly took from Busby. Um, yeah. Late in April, um, there's a historic transfer, Phil Chisnell, after um, Graham Moore's arrival and Bobby Charlton's yeah. moving to the middle, now yeah. there's no room for Chisnell to play. Um, mm -hmm. So he was transferred to Liverpool shortly. I think it was shortly after the the, the game between them. So and he and he remains, by the way, the last player to do so at the time. Uh, of the game. Indeed, but he, he after his move, twenty thousand pounds. There was a lot of uh, fundraising going on in the market. We mentioned the 32,500 for Giles. It was 20 for Chisnell to Liverpool. Last, as you say, last time, last person to travel along what in those days was the East Lancashire Road, I suppose it'd be the M62 now. But uh, the um, there were a lot of other total of sales um, adding up to nearly £100,000, which Busby would put to good effect at the end of this season. But um uh yeah chisnell though recalled in later interviews that when he went back to old trafford to play for liverpool i think once or twice um each time he would get a standing of it he would get a, a round of applause uh <laughs> whereas you can imagine that if a player went to liverpool from united now and and came back he'd well he'd get something rather other than a round of applause so yeah, there were different times, and uh, the bitterness of the United, there was no bitterness in the United-Liverpool relationship in those days. I'll read a, a quote from Chisnell um, about, about the move. He said, Busby told me that he'd received an offer from Shanks, but there was no pressure for me to go. I was only 22, and rightly or wrongly, I made the decision to move. I thought that I would get in the Liverpool team, and my career would pick up again. It was special sitting in the room with Busby and Shankly as they negotiated my future, sitting between them. Uh, between yeah. them, sorry. They were like father and son, as you said earlier, and, and thought the world of each other. Um, unfortunately for Chisnell, Liverpool were about to embark on a, a fairly um, profitable spell for themselves, and um, he, he didn't play that many times. I think it's six league games he played for Liverpool in the end. Yeah, that's that's true. They, 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 they bought well, uh, you know, with Ron Yates from Dundee United, Ian St. John from Motherwell. Those two Scottish yeah. signings were really what kicked it all off, all off for them. And uh, Chisnell, oh, as he had been at United, was a fringe player. Yeah. Um, there was silverware at Old Trafford. And uh, Murphy, who had, Jimmy Murphy, who promised uh, an FA Youth Cup would be delivered after Munich, 
um, finally coming good with that in 1964 United come up against Swindon Town in the final yeah. uh, I'm going to pop the team up on, on the screen for anyone watching this um, a great youth team here with well, many players who get into the first team you've got Jimmy Rimmering this, goal yes um, Bobby Noble, the left back and captain, who was well, yes. I mean, this it, uh, Noble's uh, it, it certainly underlines that this is the best uh youth team since the Busby Babes. Um, the, sorry, you carry on reeling off the role of honor because, yes, Bobby Noble, who's uh, for those not who aren't able to see the photograph, uh, Bobby Noble just looks like a world beater. He's standing on the end of the line with a, 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 a almost a sneer of confidence on his face what a footballer he was i remember seeing him a few times um hard as nails absolute killer but with all the ability in the world yeah the shirt looks john, Fitzpat john fitzpatrick on the on the other end uh wayne sorry yeah. to interrupt, but i just noticed him John Fitzpatrick, also hard as nails, John Fitzpatrick. Yes. You've got yeah. Willie Anderson and George Best together. Dave Sadler sat next to George. And on the end of the row, um, John Aston Jr. Um, yeah. Obviously, John Aston Sr. And um, a very pacey, decent winger in his own right. Um, yeah. We'll talk about him in episodes to come. Maybe it's probably fair to say that he would always suffer from association from from his father and benefit from it as well. But very complicated mm -hmm. relationship he would have with the United and um, the, certainly some great days to come. But the comparison is not helped by the fact that he played in exactly the same position as his father down that left flank. Um, yeah. Also got the um, so the image from when United win the Youth Cup against Swindon, uh, what well, the post match celebrations in the bath at the mm -hmm. Old Trafford, where you've got Bobby Noble again. Sans the um the shirt that was three sizes too big for him, but all in the <laughs> trophy. Yeah, yeah. And George Best uh, captured very, very happy there. Um yeah, you've got Johnny Fitzpatrick in there as well. Um great days. And obviously, I mean, you got five or six first team players from that. That's an incredible return. And uh, it is. It is. Jimmy Murphy certainly making good on his promise with that. Um, um yeah, in United inspired by Best to was um i mean it was just a star born already i mean by that yeah. point uh, best it, he was playing for so many teams obviously played all through the the ranks at united but um in in the final weeks of the season he played for the united first team and then he was called yeah. up to make his northern ireland debut yeah. um, against uruguay at windsor park and then 24 hours after that he was in the same the team for the youth cup second leg um so a very busy time for george but obviously making his impression on all levels um, yes uh we'll talk about george in a, a little bit when we come to squad as well i know we've already talked about him enough but um when we come mm. to going through the squad statistics and everything I just want to close off with a couple of things um, yeah. Paddy, because, um th this is jumping forward a little bit but because it's the agm um and i know it's from september but it really um, it's associated with where the club are at present, so I think it's best to summarise in this episode. Um, at the AGM, Busby referred to the venture of, um, and it's. I think it's important that we talk about this because we, in the pre-Munich episodes, we were talking about how there was this grand plan to build a one hundred thousand pound, uh, one thousand capacity stadium at Old Trafford. Those plans had been shelved because of the financial difficulties the club were in after Munich. Mm -hmm. Now they're a little bit better off like you said with all this wheeling and dealing the money they were bringing in even though some of it was still the amounts for for improvements but again they were looking to improve old trafford they were looking to build um an extra well provide seating and standing cover for another twenty thousand mm -hmm. spectators so that old trafford would qualify to representative matches and maybe international matches as well because england didn't always play at wembley uh, but this had this was following the the, the news that the World Cup was going to be well, it'd been awarded to England and, and Old Trafford mm -hmm. was going to be included in the, the host stadiums for that. So United were, again, looking more prosperous in terms of the the financial situation, what they were doing away from the first team as well. Um, a, a quote from Busby at, that, um, at the AGM, which I, I found interesting. 
Uh, Manchester United are a name in English football and we want to keep it that way. Also, there have been many changes in the game recently, such as the no maximum wage and new contracts, which have been difficult to surmount. The directors in the club have adapted to the situation. Clubs must give the public entertainment and this we will continue to try to do. The only way to survive is to meet change as it comes. Mm. I find those last couple of sentences really interesting. Firstly, because obviously the commitment to entertainment it yeah. remains a paramount thing. And secondly, yeah. meet change as it comes. United wouldn't be like that in the future. They would be very much anticipate the change before it happens and make the change. Uh -huh. But I don't know if that... I'm not saying it's a, um, a behind-the-times approach. I don't think it was. It was just kind of like, we'll, do, we'll concentrate on what we're doing and when the change comes, we'll embrace it in the best way mm. we can. Mm. Yeah, I think I, I find it I was a little bit like a politician's uh, conference speech. Uh, it, it, difficult to know how to interpret it, but I think what what was definitely behind him and and in it behind everything that he did and suggested was, and you can later see the same thing in Sir Alex Ferguson in that he's constantly pushing the board. Yeah. To, to, to make Manchester United more grand, uh, in the best sense, really, more large scale. Um, the, the plan for the new stand, of course, was scaled down uh, because we mentioned pre-Munich the um, plan for 100,000 capacity stadium, uh, which was going, actually going to be announced. Well, That's uh, the idea. plan was to announce it immediately after um, uh, the period of Munich, um, or was to get on with it anyway. But of course, Munich completely destroyed that as well as the team and everything else. Um, but now this plan to embrace the pre-World Cup euphoria um, at the same time as having the, you know, the European Footballer of the Year, plus a couple yeah. more who would be the same. It, in a way, you can see the beginnings of the modern, glamorous Manchester United beginning to take place at this time. Of course, the um, the the um, Busby Babes team was glamorous. Of course, it was caught the imagination of not only the whole of Britain but beyond. But this uh, sort of star system at Manchester United probably. The genesis was around this time. And also at the same time, I think, Wayne, when we've discussed this before, you've mentioned that once again, the crowd crept up. The average crowd crept up. In yeah, the third season in a row. After, yeah. after Munich, there had been a sort of sense of a few years of when the crowd had actually leveled off or even gone down. Uh, and it was back up now, wasn't it, in this season? Back up towards... 46,000. Um, 45, 891 was the average attendance yeah. this season. Yeah. So, yeah. Which, and that's that's pretty that's pretty good, give, given that the stadium still only holds about 5,000 more than that. So, yeah. it's, um, yeah, it, looking back on it, this is a period of, of great excitement at, at Manchester United. I think as well, we talked about Busby's convalescence and the fact that, I mean, emotionally, the, that yeah. journey to, to actually have that kind of enthusiasm again would have yeah. felt, I mean, as natural as grief is, you don't yeah. sometimes you don't feel the enthusiasm because it's a betrayal of, of the grief. And yeah. I think that the greatest thing that United did with the Youth Cup team is that it, like you talk about the genesis, it's almost breathing new life back into United because that was yeah. the core of them. Yes. And for them to come through, like like children do, they like and young players. When when you're an experienced coach like these guys were, they were captivated again by the vibrancy of these young players who played with such a spirit. I mean, Aston was one, Sadler another, because he had such great intelligence, and you know that they, they could see these young players coming through. Bobby Noble, like I said, very very confident player. George obviously, and, and Willie Anderson and John Fitzpatrick. All these lads had a lot of character about them, and you can see why that was beginning yeah. to rub off. And they were looking forward again. So you, you can also 
almost feel the the renewed enthusiasm in the way yeah. that Busby talks. Um... Well, you know a lot about the, the history of, of Jimmy Murphy, and my mind goes back to the phrase, keep the flag flying uh, at, at, at Munich, which, where a stricken Busby, um, you know, said that to, to Murphy, and Murphy made that promise. Whether he meant, you know, just, you know, save the season or... But somehow... Murphy kept the flag flying with, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, with this youth team yeah. that he produced and, and with, with, with some really outstanding players in it. Um, and, and, you know, Noble and, and Best obviously being two particularly good examples. But yeah, the, the flag was flying. And I, in fact, when you talk about the effervescence within the club, you, it can, the, uh, John Aston, when when I spoke to him, John Aston Jr., uh, when I spoke to him, he talked about the wonderful, that was a beautiful picture you showed of them, the lads in the bath. And he said, he told me that they would, they would get in the bath after training every day, and often the water would go cold because they would stay in the bath singing Beatles songs. <laughs> until the water went freezing and they had to get out. So, um, yeah, there was a great, they helped to, to create a, uh, yeah, the flag was flying again at Old Trafford and, and the kids had a lot to do with that, yeah. And of, 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 quite apart, apart from anything else, they put pressure on, you know, with the likes of Anderson, uh, Best, Sadler being fed into the first team. Yeah. You know, the, the players were looking, you know, they're all, their guys were looking over the shoulders again. Well, that's that's a good thing in a club, isn't it? Absolutely, and I think as well the the distance from Munich. So we're like five years on, but it needed needed this time to sort of like separate. The, we've talked about the Pearsons, the Dawsons, the Quicksouls. These players who carried that burden, and then the likes of Best and Anderson and Noble, they came sort of two or three years after that had happened. So yeah. there was this policy around the club that they didn't it wasn't a written rule or anything they just didn't speak about munich and they didn't put the pressure on so these kids no. were unaffected by that yes which uh, which i think is a, a profoundly important thing in the development um, while we're talking about that and helped yes. them have their natural spirit rather than be weighed down by this sort of grief that existed yeah it was, i mean barry fry who came in who one of the best uh, the england schoolboys um, of the of around that you know that time in the early to mid sixties, he went to join the youth. He was in Busby, courted him and landed him uh, to join the United Youth ranks. And he said, he confirmed what you said that Munich was never talked about. He said it was only many years later that Barry Fry said that he realised that quite often if the kids were in the presence of Charlton or um, or uh, Charlton or Bill Fultz, their moods would swing. One day Bobby Charlton would come and say, hello boys, how are you? This, that and the other. And even Bill would be a bit like that some days. Other days they'd just come in and they'd be silent. And it was only later that the penny dropped that they were still carrying the burden of Munich. Yeah, yeah. It's um, incredible, really, that this unspoken journey that those guys were on. Yeah. How, in a few years, when um, the the pinnacle occurs, that mm. it's embraced so fully um, yeah. and openly. It's, it's incredible. But we're on that journey. We're talking about it as we're going along. Um, and those days are to come. Let's talk about the squad then. Let's go through the yep. squad statistics. Um, the goalkeepers, and now I've got Wilf Tranter on the screen, but that's only because it's going to take me a little while to get to him with the, the goalkeepers. Now, Harry Gregg would have been the senior goalkeeper. 27 appearances, 25 in the league. But David Gaskell was the senior yeah. goalkeeper with 29 appearances, 17 of those in the league. So Gregg played more often in the league. The, the key decision here for Busby was Greg's shoulder wasn't getting any better. Gaskell, I mean, he'd been around the first team picture for seven or eight years now, but I think Busby had thought, I, I probably need a, a better, reliable replacement for 
for Greg. So that's where his mind is going with the goalkeeper situation. And the fullback areas, Shea Brennan, um, pretty much staying at it. I mean, he could have probably had his picker clubs to move elsewhere. 24 appearances and 17 of those in the league. But he's not the first choice at fullback because those are dominated by Tony Dunn. 54 appearances in all competitions and 40 of those um, were in the league. And Noel Cantwell, who's 35 appearances in all competitions and 28 in the league. Bill Folks is the regular centre half there, 55 appearances. These lads all clocking up more than 50. 55 in all uh, competitions, one goal, 41 appearances in the league. In the half back line, you've got Pat Crerand, two goals in 55, one in 41 in the league. Maurice Setters, five in 46, and four in 32 in the league. Nobby Styles again, another of those who could have had his pick of clubs elsewhere. And, you know, he would have probably been a little bit disgruntled by the fact that, you know, Setters and Crerand are so dominant in that area. But he puts in a fair share of appearances here with 21, 17 in the league. Wilf Tranter now, we're finally at him. He's a halfback who came through the youth system. He was described by one of his future clubs as strongly built. Um, he makes his debut in March, two days after his 19th birthday. Bill Folks, this is one game. It's the trip to West Ham. Um, Tranter, it's his only game for the club, actually, but he was praised for his man-marking job on West Ham's Johnny Byrne as United yeah. won 2-0. So... Um, a notable debut, but it felt folks is so dominant in that position that I, and, and so reliable as well. By the yeah. way, he's just not going to be moved. Um, and Trano <laughs> moves on elsewhere. Uh, Willie Anderson, Liverpool born winger, even younger than George when he was brought into the side for his own debut, not quite 17. So he was one month of his from his 17th birthday. And like you said earlier, Paddy, he's more of a proper winger than best. Um, Looking at the supply line, not in the exact mould of Johnny Berry, he did like a trick or two, but um, similar. Yeah, but, um, he makes three appearances this season. Like I said, he came into the side for his debut over Christmas, but um, only made three appearances, two of those in the league. And he said, he, I mean, I spoke to him a couple of times, firstly for the book on on George, and he, yeah, he, he's you know, he said a few things about. Um, how daunting it was to move from Liverpool to Manchester. He said, "I was a, the best soccer around where I, a soccer player around where I grew up. But when I joined United, they were all as good as me, and most yeah. of them were even better. That was something of a shock to my system. But he was a, a great long distance runner. He was a very competitive sportsman. His pace and vibrancy were very helpful to the team. And more than that, that kind of competitiveness helped push the youth players around him. The likes of John Fitzpatrick." The likes of George. Um, he's a very important character to have around and very popular with those lads as well. Um, it brings us on to George. Obviously, I want more to say about him. He makes 26 appearances in all competitions, six goals, 17 and four in the league. Um, it's, it's basically a half season, isn't it, Paddy? Like, and yeah. I wonder if like, you might liken it to like a young animal learning to walk, like a giraffe or something. Sometimes it's a bit awkward, sometimes a little bit nervous or reticent like could he really do these things that he's been he'd been doing at the cliff or to youth teams against his senior opponents i mean mm. we'll talk about the plaudits that will follow in future episodes but yeah. on talent alone you might even be tempted to say that this boy who's only just 18 at the end of the season he's already mm. one of the very best in the league and it's yeah. only really his age and maybe that hesitance to think no he, he can't be he, he's much too premature to be talking like this. That's the only thing, really, wasn't it, that was stopping everyone being certified and saying, oh, he's actually one of the best players in the league. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but there was that sense of excitement. I think <clears throat> it was, <clears throat> as I recall it, um, it was a little bit like the excitement around Everton when Wayne Rooney was coming through the ranks. Yeah. Yeah, and when he came into the team, and you said, you you suddenly, you know, the Evertonian sudden and the world suddenly, or Britain suddenly saw that uh, Wayne Rooney was every every bit of hype was justified, yeah. every rumor was founded. It was a little bit like that. You looked at him and you thought, oh yes, and yeah. in a way, it was it was only. 
I think for physical reasons that Matt didn't want to wear him out. Uh, that, that the reason that he only, as you say, he only played half the games over this over the season. Um, but uh, you know, all the time they were they were hoping to build, you know, waiting for his physique to fill out. And of course, in the end, he was to be, become, uh, you know, anything. He certainly didn't lack physicality um, in 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 the peak of the, the albeit short peak of his career. But yes, it was just purely physical that that, that he that he didn't play uh, as many games as he could because he was already outstanding and and and, and the, although a very different player to Wayne Rooney he, in terms of the excitement and the revelation, uh, I would draw that comparison. Yeah, um, let's talk about the outgoing players. There's Chisnell. He played eight. Uh, 28 in all competitions, eight goals, six in 20 in the league. Johnny Giles, obviously, just that single appearance mm-hmm. uh, and, and no goals. Albert Quicksall, three in 13, three in nine in the league before he, he was on his way. And also, um, is there another player who left? I don't think. Uh, there were one or two. Uh, I'm just trying to think who else left. Um but it was a it was a major clear out of 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 people. As I say, the total I mean Giles, yes, um, the total received was was a hundred thousand pounds. And at the end of the season, he United spent that fifty six thousand more than half of that money on John Connelly, um, yeah. the brilliant Burnley winger. Uh, and what a great, uh, a fine signing that was to prove. Um, but as I say, that was in the summer of '64, um, after uh, the end of this this season that we're discussing. But it was the 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 old old thing. He would sell, Busby would sell first to raise the money, and only once he'd got the money would he spend it. Yeah. Um, just to close off the squad stats, we've got Graham Moore. Like yeah. I said, signed in November '63, a midfielder and a forward. With Giles gone, Quicksall on his way, a little bit more experience in there, and he came from Chelsea for thirty-five thousand. A Welsh international as well, so obviously tipped off to Busby by Murphy would have been very happy with him. And he had a decent crack at it: five in nineteen in in the in all competitions, four in eighteen mm-hmm. in the league. So it's a decent return, mm-hmm. but uh, the timing was wrong for him. You know, he picked up a few injuries as well, and the emergence of all of these players really didn't um, help him. Ian Moyer, 3-18 in, um, in, in the league, as well as, you know, obviously he was the first to profit from Giles's exit. We've got David Sadler as well. Um, we mentioned earlier, like you said, he was spotted as an amateur playing for, for Maidstone, and both Bills, Busby and Murphy made that trip to sign him. What really stood out for, for him was his positional intelligence and his maturity on the ball. Like I said, he was... Um, training to work in the bank, he actually had to be convinced to be a footballer, didn't he? Um, yeah, but, um, he was so mature, and that maturity allowed him to settle into life in in the first team straight away. Really, he was that's why he was one of the first, well, the first from that group to to be given the chance. Um, a tall lad, um, very classy on the ball, and um, yeah, he had this sense of timing and position that made it was him, that's him. right. That's what that's he he was of the Bobby Moore persuasion, but both Matt and Jimmy Murphy were always on at him to take man and ball, be like Bill, be like Bill Fool, yes. take man and ball together. But it just wasn't in Sadler's nature, he liked <laughs> to uh to, to be more, a bit more subtle and <laughs> and a bit more surgical. Um. Yeah, and then the last two, um, Dennis Lowe, we've already talked about him, 30 and 30 in the league, um, 46 goals in all competitions. You had him as 41 games. It says on this stat thing that I'm reading off 42. I think it was... No, uh, I meant over the calendar year for you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, that's for right. For uh, European purposes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. For, 46 and 42 in all competitions. Um, yeah, 30 and 30 in the league for, for Dennis Lowe. And David Hurd, again, I, I, we're going to talk about two unsung heroes here that will be getting their due. I think but Danny, uh, David Hurd, 27 goals in 44 games, yeah. uh, 20 and 30 in, in, in the league. And Bobby yeah. Charlton, 15 in 54, 9 in 40. And again, we've rarely talked about Bobby because he's just 
we were talking about this before we started recording this episode, mm. he's always there. He's always putting in a shift. But as we mentioned earlier in the episode, this mm. this season, though, the latter half of it, just when George is breaking into the side, it's also a pivotal time for George, uh, for, for Bobby because he's Bobby, moving yeah. more central now. Mm. And um, basically getting into that inside forward position that the likes of Moore and the likes of Chisnell couldn't nail down for themselves. So a very influential period that has already been the case for Bobby Chol and about to become even more so in the near future. Um, I'll come on to tactics in a moment before I do that. Just United's colours this season, red. And I mentioned, because normally I said they're always, they're always staying the same, but little changes this time around. Red shirts, white shorts, red socks, mm-hmm. and red socks on the away kit as well. So um, the red socks really the only change, but they, that's... There were changes nonetheless. The average attendance we already mentioned um, rose to 45.891. And Dennis Law, um, yeah, as we mentioned earlier in the episode, three out tricks in the previous season, seven this time round. So that's 10 in two years at United, which is just ridiculous. Yeah. Mm. Um, the key results, I would say, you know, I mean, United, a couple of big wins over Spurs, which I think were notable. Obviously, the early season win over Everton was a really good marker. Um, but in terms of progression, losing 3 0 to Liverpool is a, a great indication of how much they still need to improve to to kick on. And I think the Lisbon defeat and the embarrassment there had huge ramifications for how United would deal with the European games in, in the near future. So, some key results in there and how, how it shapes United's um, future, really. Um, elsewhere in football, Paddy, Liverpool, you mentioned it earlier. It's the first time we're saying it, unfortunately, isn't going to be the last in this series. Liverpool win the league. Um, West Ham going to win the FA Cup, inspired by Bobby Moore, and Leicester win the League Cup as well. So, uh, yeah, rosy times for a lot of those clubs and hopefully rosy times for United with their own silverware, obviously, with the FA Youth Cup. Um, they'll be looking to kick on and, and win a trophy in the next episode for sure. Um, if you're watching the video... Please give it a like and subscribe. And Oh, no, hang on. Before I get to the conclusion, look at the tactics which I've been avoiding, and they're on the screen there. So, yeah. I, I've, I, so I've interestingly, Paddy, I, I didn't really know the best way to go about this because some, no. um, some of the positions are um, you can split with a cigarette card, basically. Yeah. Um, Greg and Gaskell, it's 27 and 29 appearances. Greg's the first choice, which is why I've put him in. Gaskell yeah. played more games. Uh, Chisnell's there, but obviously by the end of the season, you can move that around because Moore's been playing games there and, and Sadler's been playing games there. And as we've said, Charlton's moving inside as well. Yes. Um, so there's a lot of changes in there. It's not a defined... That's not what you would no, say. That no, 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 it's not. Particularly as we mentioned earlier that Charlton was increasingly uh, drifted, uh, you know, was moving into the, the role in which he was to achieve so much. For England as well as United, in other words, a sort of position between where Chisnell and Law are in your in in your diagram, because Chisnell, as you say, went went out. Also, Charlton's position, John Canelli, who, who I've just referred, yeah. with, you know, obviously Best was was going to make one of the wing positions his own. <clears throat> so uh, John Canelli was signed. Uh, to take the other wing position. So, uh, yeah, it was obvious that, that Busby now saw Charlton as driving through the middle behind the centre forward. David Hurd's days were beginning to be numbered, but he rightly, uh, given his achievements in the season and the fact that he played all through the season, he's rightly in your team. Uh, Setters rightly as well in midfield alongside Crerant, but in deep midfield. But Busby just... to uh, give you, just to give people a, an idea, although he'd been a good signing for United, Busby was getting, was getting a bit, and part of the reason Busby wanted him was because he was a voice in the dressing room, but Busby was beginning to get a little bit tired of his voice now. Um, so he, his days were, were num- are numbered, but on the plus side, Tony Dunn, who's on the right side of defence, right fullback, in your typical team isn't it funny how we always leave tony Dunn to the last how we always underplay his contribution to the team uh you know signed for five thousand quid from shelburne what 
less than two years before the period we are talking about, he's an ever present. You gave out his statistics, virtually yeah. ever present at right back. And what a consistently outstanding player he was to become. There he is, already embedded. He can't be more than about 21. And he's already embedded in that team. Bobby Noble, no, not yet. But uh, injury anyway was to cast an evil fate on his career. Uh, but great to great to see that uh, that uh, lineup there, uh, even if most of them are, uh, well, many of them are about to be moved aside. Yeah. Well, you know, you got lucky with Tony Dunn. You're never going to get a, a, a fullback from Ireland who can play in two fullback positions. Right? <laughs> <laughs> if they've been blessed through the one, they'll never get another, which <laughs> is just ridiculous, really, when you consider yeah. that it covers over a thousand games between them. Um, talk yeah. about Denny Serwin, of course, for anyone. Uh, uh -huh. Just ridiculous how blessed United were with that. Um, but done. Um, perhaps not as technical as Dennis, but had the strength and pace that Dennis perhaps didn't have. Um, mm. But yeah, they never played. Well, they'd that. certainly be a candidate for the two best fullbacks ever to play for United. Yeah, I did. and just a slightly despite deviate Johnny from the topic. Carey, we... Despite Johnny Carey, another another Irishman. Yeah, when we um we were fortunate enough to record a podcast with Martin Edwards in, in recent years. And didn't he mention that, that he, that he tinkered with the idea in his all-time team of putting Dunn and Irwin at fullback so he could swap them? And I think he'd mentioned that. So that's an interesting thing. But yeah. yeah, um, yeah. It, 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 everyone talks about swapping your wingers during the game. Nobody talks about swapping your fullbacks to confuse the wingers. That's not a bad idea. But uh, Yeah, if any coaches are listening to this or yeah, watching... We've We've just hit on something. We've just hit on the new big thing. It, 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 don't tell Pep Guardiola. Yeah, I'll do and just. <laughs> it in my for it. <laughs> oh, sorry, I, I forgot. Yeah, we're we're not on an unbiased channel here now. No, oh, no. He, I mean, I, I've got no problem with him knowing, just as long as we get the credit for for coming up with it. <laughs> Uh, yeah okay if you're watching this video please give it a like and subscribe and join in the conversation in the comment section if you're listening back on the audio podcast please be sure to subscribe and give us a review on that platform you're listening on thanks for watching thanks for listening